hear me? Hello, uh, hello good morning, bonjour, buenos dias. Uh, my name is Rémi Parmentier. I'm with the Varda Group, uh, and uh, I will be your facilitator for, for this uh, session. Thank you very much for coming, and uh, thank you very much to the uh, uh, Trade and Sustainable Development Symposium team for, uh, for hosting, hosting us here. Uh, I will ask you to, to sit down and uh, and maybe uh, if everybody's in the room, and maybe to, to shut the door uh, so that we, we can hear each other well. Yes? Oh. Um, oh, I'm sorry. So you can hear me, I'm sorry. And so we're going to, uh, to discuss uh, one of the key issues, uh, which is on the agenda of the uh, WTO meeting, meeting this week. It's, uh, Harmful fisheries subsidies, yeah. and we have with us um, Ambassador David Walker from New Zealand, who is. Can we call it, call you uh, the champion of this issue, uh, David? I think that's that's a fair description. Yes, I, I, I I've one of them. Yes, but you're certainly a, a champion of this issue. You've been working on this issue for very many years. I understand. Yeah. I, I think I know that. You even did your PhD study on, on the issue of uh, fishery subsidies, unless uh, I'm wrong. One, one little application of it, not as broadly as this discussion is. Yes, well, uh, and uh, so you're, 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 you're very knowledgeable. And we have Claire Nouvian, the CEO and the founder of uh, Bloom, the uh, European-based uh, NGO specialized in Ocean conservation. It's 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 always a pleasure to work uh, with uh, with Claire in Brussels and in Paris. Uh, everybody knows her as the overfishing terminator, and uh, it's good that uh, we have the overfishing terminator here at at the WTO. Uh, Peter Thompson, Ambassador uh, Peter Thompson, the uh, special uh, envoy of the UN. Secretary General uh, for the Ocean and former President of the uh, UN uh, General Assembly uh, is on his way, but uh, as I, I think some of you know, there has been problems with flights due to the uh, uh, snow and ice in, in Europe, and he's still on his way. I Realistically, I don't think he'll make it he'll, uh, on time. He will be at another session uh, this afternoon uh, at the Sheraton, where he will uh, be moderating another discussion on fishery subsidies. But Ambassador Thompson has, from Madrid Airport, uh, sent me uh, a message that he's asked me to, to read to you. Uh, and I think it's a good departure point uh, for for this meeting, so maybe uh, with your permission, uh, I will read it, or somebody else would like to read it. Uh, I, I don't have a Fijian accent, so, uh, but here it is. Uh, is that's Ambassador Thompson saying that SDG 14, <coughs> the Ocean uh, Sustainable Development Goal, contains a key measure for preserving the sustainability of the world's commercial fish stocks. And I, Peter Thompson, refer to the uh, provisions of target 14.6, <coughs> calling for the prohibition of certain forms of fishery subsidies by 2020. Here in Buenos Aires this week, the WTO has a heavy responsibility to act in defense of the sustainability of uh, global fisheries. I urge you all to make this week count to raise ambition and determination for the uh, common good to push for the adoption of the most meaningful language to achieve SDG 14.6 and to show ourselves and the world that the multilateral system works, most importantly that it works 
to protect the well-being of the generations to come. So that was uh, Ambassador uh, Peter Thompson, the special envoy of the UN General uh, Secretary General. Um, <coughs> I will ask you to react, uh, Ambassador uh, David Walker, to this statement. But before you do, uh, I would like to say that I would like to encourage as much as possible interactivity with you. It's, uh, there are people here on the panel, that's inevitable, but because we did not have space to, to do a round, uh, you know, to all sit with you, but uh, interactivity is, is highly encouraged. And I, I, I see in the room uh, Alice Tipping from ICTSD, who is a, a a very, very esteemed uh, expert in this issue, and we will uh, uh, invite uh, Alice to, 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 to contribute. Uh, I also see uh, uh, William Emerson from the FAO, and uh, also see friends from, from different uh, delegations and NGOs, and I, 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 we will in encourage you to, to participate. Uh, let me say uh, in that regard that we're going to apply the Chatham House rule. That means that unless you say otherwise, uh, individual statements uh, will not be attributed so that you are comfortable with, uh, with speaking freely. We will attempt to have a uh, very short uh, note of, on the outcome of, of, of this discussion and we'll, we'll endeavor to have it ready on time for four o'clock when uh, the negotiators uh, start uh, meeting again uh, on, on the draft text uh, on, on, on this issue. Talking of the draft text, it is available on screen and also we have a few hard copies here uh, should it be, uh, should it be uh, required. So, um, with no further, uh, uh, not taking further time, uh, Ambassador Walker. So you've heard uh, Ambassador uh, Thompson. I'm interested, and everybody's interested to to see uh, how you share uh, his uh, his uh, his appraisal and of what needs to be done, and uh, also most importantly, you who are in the thick of the negotiations, what are your expectations this week on this issue? Well, thank you very much, first of all, Remy, for the invitation to be here with you all today. Uh, it's, um, it's a very uh, exciting time uh, in what has been a long endeavor, I think. Um, absolutely, I would agree with, uh, with um, the, the statement, uh, and I think that's very much where New Zealand is coming from and in approaching uh, this issue here. Uh, as you say, we have long been associated with um, the, uh, the effort um, to try and uh, bring some disciplines uh, in this area. We, we lead, uh, have led for a while, continue to lead a, a group in the WTO which is called the, the Friends of Fish. And this, um, this effort uh, to develop uh, WTO disciplines on, on subsidies uh, in the fisheries area uh, has been going for many, many years. Uh, we now have um, here in Buenos Aires uh, the first um, really dedicated uh, sit-down uh, amongst ministers to talk about this issue and talk about what um, we as WTO members uh, will do about it, and, and I think that's due in um, very large part to the uh, development of the SDG uh, 14.6 Sustainable Development Goals. 14.6 um, is very, very clear. Um, you can see a number of elements of it there. It's here on the screen, by the way. Yeah. And that um, that is requiring uh, each and every um, member of the UN to do this, right? So each and every uh, government, at the head of government, the leader, has pledged that this is what they will do. So my assumption from being part of a government which has one leader, when our leader says what we are supposed to do as a country, that's what we set out to do and implement as a government. So my assumption is that every government is now doing the same. Um, but what 
what we're talking about here in the World Trade Organization context is to try and put some uh, common approaches around expectations of what that requires uh, in terms of a framework, and then a, a sort of mutual assurance uh, that yes, everybody is doing this, they're working to the common framework, so it's a mutually supportive uh, environment um, internationally for each uh, WTO member to be doing this uh, themselves. Um, the other thing that, uh, that has happened is that for the first time we now have a very uh, intensive negotiation going on uh, which is directed towards the development of a legal instrument, a, an agreement, um, to put this into effect. Um, that, uh, uh, no, I'm not talking about this. Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm talking about a, a negotiation for a full-fledged uh, legal, legally enforceable agreement on, uh, on the prohibition uh, of certain forms of fish subsidies to give full effect to SDG 14.6 in its entirety. That um, People got to that effort, I would say, too late uh, in the process to have delivered a full outcome here uh, in, in Buenos Aires. But the important thing is they have started that effort and everybody is engaged in it. And so you start to see um, all of the issues being flushed out uh, in that conversation and people thinking seriously back at home, if I had to do this and be held to account internationally, what does that mean? What, how would I do it? How would I put it into effect? And therefore, what obligations can I take in the WTO context in you know, really some detail? So that's been the preparation coming into this. And there's been a lot of work done in the negotiating group, the, the rules negotiating group with um, Wayne McCook as the chair of that, putting in tremendous hours, him and the experts uh, working non-stop to try and develop what a text would look like um, in, in an effort that they could you know, bring it here and potentially crack all those nuts and would have an agreement at the end of it. Well, they, they just ran out of time because they started too late and that effort surfaced some of the complexities in here that really had been sitting below the surface that people hadn't really thought about uh, as governments. But those issues are now out um, and surfaced uh, in Geneva um, and the, the key thing following on from this meeting here is that in respect of that effort, we come out with a really strong call from all the ministers saying, OK, you negotiators, get back to that work. Start again in you know, January. Don't wait for months and months and months. You get right down to it. And we want you to develop that um, full legal agreement. So we've got it ready and there in time to put into place by the next time we meet. Because if you think of the 2020 clock, Right. Uh, if we'd had the agreement here now, governments would have had some transition time of how they were going to implement it. So they would be fully implemented by 2020. We don't. How do you get to 2020? If you're going to get to 2020, you have to have the agreement ready to go, ready to put into force by the next time that the ministers meet, which you know, normally every two years, the end of 2019, that's right on the cusp of 2020. So that agreement has to go into force then, and then bang, cold turkey, you've got a really strong call that WTO needs to finish these negotiations. And there's a couple of pieces to that. First of all is a, a prohibition around subsidies to IUU, <coughs> and You've seen the documents, there's a whole lot of alternatives there. For those who are not entirely familiar, IUU is illegal, unregulated, unreported, unreported. Uh, fishing. Yeah. The three elements. Three elements. And um, the, the discussion amongst the, the members has, has surfaced the fact that um, you know, there's differences in those things. Uh, illegal, everybody can kind of get their head around that, but when you get into um, those other use, the 
unregulated and unreported, uh, especially for some developing countries. Um, they don't quite have the systems in place right now to fully implement that in a legal way. So then how do you capture that in a political um, commitment that in the interim people are going to do something? Because that's what this ministerial declaration is around. It's saying that in the interim, while we reach this final agreement, we're going to do something. So that first bit is around how you capture that, the uh, IUU prohibition part. We, um, plus uh, some of our uh, supporters, uh, also think we should capture a political commitment right now on overfished. Because, you know, overfished, those fish can't wait, right? Um, so you definitely shouldn't be putting subsidies into um, activity that's, uh, o that's going at overfished stocks. And more than 30% of the um, assessed stocks are in an overfished capacity. That, that's that language there. Um, and you'll see there's a, uh, yeah, a couple, couple of ways, a couple of little options um, sitting in there for ministers to think about um, how they want to, how they might approach this in the interim. Would it be a, a hard commitment? Would it be, um, we're going to try to do this um, because we might not have, again, we might not have the ways of fully ensuring that we're, we're in compliance with that. What, what has happened is that even though this is a ministerial declaration, uh, a lot of the issues that have been swirling around the legal text come into consideration of this ministerial declaration because people have realised, whoops, you know, we can't actually do that right now today, um, so can we commit to do something that we really can't do? So as this declaration comes out, um, you'll see that ministers following that discussion have grappled with how they can actually best express the commitment in a way that expresses their intent but doesn't necessarily commit themselves to something that they know right now that they cannot do. That's, that's the discussion uh, that's going on. But the counterpart to that is again my assumption that having you know surfaced those back home in each of the capitals, people are going to be saying, gosh, we've got to get our systems in order and we've got to be able to do this to, to meet this um, SDG and it's very limited time. There are other parts of the agenda, better transparency, can we um, make sure that we're expressing that due restraint uh, commitment in the SDG in the, in, in the interim? So all of those are sitting there in that declaration as well. It's going to be a really hard slog to get this declaration up um, because governments coming here are not only dealing with fish, they're dealing with other areas um, and some governments and some of the areas of interest that they're looking at are probably going to be pretty disappointed including us in, in some of the areas that we want to see. Um, but we happen to think that this fish process is unique. It stands on its own because of this top level of government commitment in the SDG 14.6, and therefore we have to make as much progress as we can now and deliver the rest of it um, within the next uh, year too, so it's good to go. So absolutely trying to operationalise what Ambassador Thompson is talking about. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador uh, Walker. Uh, in, re in, in reaction to, to what you've said, maybe I, I have a, a, if you allow me and if Claire allows me, uh, a follow-up question. Uh, just uh, you've given a, a sense of uh, optimism, like major incremental step could, uh, could happen here in Buenos Aires, maybe even a waterfall uh, because as we see it, it looks like we're moving from the discussion on whether that should take place to how that should take place. Um, what would you tell to people from uh, civil society? I can re recognize some here in, in this room and people from uh, delegations as well, uh, you know, what you expect from them or what, what they could do to to contribute to the success? Well, I, th I think you're right to characterize it in, in that way. Um, uh, it's difficult to put it together and you know, there's going to be a lot of work goes on behind the scenes before you'll see the language that comes, comes out. 
But I think it is a it is a really serious uh, endeavour that all members uh, are now engaged in. So um, civil society should keep um, urging um, and continue to urge uh, all governments to take action to deliver on 14.6 and to do the part of that which is required um, through the WTO, but also to recognise that just in practical terms and in the way governments and politics works, uh, Rome is never built in a day. Um, and every journey really does have to start with that first step. But we, we still do think that we can have a prospect of having a first really meaningful step coming out of uh, Buenos Aires here. Well, to be fair, the first step was uh, triggered by New Zealand almost 20 years ago, right? And, and, that, and that's amazing. That, uh, and, and we hope that it will accelerate now. Uh, and the reason why I was asking this question is you may have noticed that uh, we are all wearing a, a badge that says uh, no political tango, uh, please. Of course, we're in Buenos Aires. Uh, and what we mean by that is, is that too often we see uh, the negotiation making one step forward and then two steps backward. That's what we call the, the political tango and, and it's time to go on a straight line and uh, stop uh, uh, making a political tango. So Claire, uh, we'd like to hear from you, uh, the uh, civil society expert uh, on this issue. Uh, why you came? It's the first time you're coming to, to the WTO. We see you in the European Parliament all the time uh, and in, in ministries in Europe, but it's your first time in, in, at the WTO, so it must mean that you think it's really important, and uh, I think it would be useful for us to tell us uh, why you think it is important. Hi. Oh my God, that's very... <laughs> okay, now you're all awake. <laughs> Um, so good, um, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. Actually, it's not right. It's not my first time with the WTO at all. I was with Oceana in 2008, uh, trying to get through a deal on fishery subsidies. So, uh, civil society was very strongly engaged by then, and the WTO was had already acknowledged that the reason why it's important to cut a deal is because there will be no sustainable fisheries if we keep providing the financial incentive to overfish. It's as straight as that. So unfortunately, for as long as we keep providing the wrong subsidies, because subsidizing, we're not against subsidies, and I want to make it very clear, you can have good subsidies. If you go data collection, you know, enforcing, monitoring, that can be very good. Um, if you want to convert highly destructive gear to low impact gear, that's very good subsidies as well, probably. Uh, but definitely um, most subsidies, 60% of them are harmful. So that's why we are delighted to see that the WTO is actually sitting down and, and progressing and we have a draft text. And that's very encouraging because, of course, uh, civil society was becoming very frustrated, like you um, negotiators and ambassadors within the WTO, to see that we all know that we cannot have one single country fix a world problem. You can fix your EEZ problems, you can fix your national jurisdictions um, legislation, and you can do better, you can show the world, and that's typically what you've done in New Zealand, trying to show that you can be a case to show that there is an economic case to actually manage your resources in a way that makes sense economically and they make sense ecologically. At the end of the day, it makes sense for jobs. It is just what we call sustainable development. And that's what we have to get with an agreement. So yes, from all these years, almost 10 years, um, I'm really glad to see that th this is progressing. In the meantime, there's been a complete deflate of this topic within the WTO. That's why civil society stopped engaging because progress was not being made. And you know, this human, almost hard to understand and define, but it's momentum, it's called momentum. This momentum was lacking. And indeed the SDGs, the fact that the UN adopted such high reaching goals for humanity and for sustainable use of all resources um, and especially our ocean SDG, really made a difference. 
So definitely it's important because um, we have to bear in mind, and I know that you really want to make sure that this session is not about theology. We're going to give you more data because you all know why you're sitting down and trying to progress and crack at an agreement. At the same time, please bear in mind that we have facts and figures that should really make sure that delegates keep them in mind because they are the reasons why you need to not let go of this issue. So indeed, I was going to do exactly that. Uh, we put together a briefing called Time to Get the Math Right. It's been time to get the math right for some time, actually, but right now, over almost 20 years, it's, you know, you've been discussing this at the WTO since 1999. So that's it. We've really come, we've got to, to, get, to get a good agreement because since 1996, the world has been losing every year 1.2 million tons of fish. That's how much capture we are failing to grab every year. So it's the, the wild captures from the ocean are going down. So there's less and less fish being caught because there's too many being caught too efficiently by too many large scale fleets. And what's for us extremely important for delegates and everyone to bear in mind is to make sure that everyone loses at this game. There is no beneficial you know, actor. You may have a very short term industry you know, shareholder that's going to be happy to, you know, he's invested some capital in a large-scale boat, and it's probably going to make sense for a few individuals. But we really are talking about a, a bunch of individuals, a handful of industry, um, fishing industry, large-scale fleets, which are getting a lot of, um, of uh, benefits from, from not having a WTO discipline and from be being able to go out there and overfish. So there's been data, there's been science. We know that 90% of um, subsidies worldwide are given to large-scale fleets. And we know that large-scale fleets are the reasons why we have too much capacity and too much efficiency at catching fish. So this is not sustainable, not even for industry actors. So we do need to reduce overcapacity. There is no way around that. And, and most subsidies do fuel overcapacity. So our, we have many messages that we want to carry out to negotiators, of course, but we definitely, first, we really want to say, and we want to be clear about that, that we're happy that there is a draft text. We find it very encouraging. At the same time, there is a lot of bracketed text that we think some of, actually, some of these elements of language are damaging and would diminish the level of ambition. And if you want to stick to the mandate clearly, explicitly phrased by SDG 14.6, you need to make sure that you tackle overfish stocks and overcapacity. Because overfishing and overcapacity have an intricate, incestuous liaison. You know, they, have, they, they work together. Subsidies encourage overcapacity. Overcapacity fuels overfishing. Overfishing fuels social crisis. And, and, and at the end of the day, unemployment, and at the end of the day, political instability. So whether we like or not like in industrial actors, it's not a matter of knowing if we want to respond to the pressure they may exert or not. We do need to tackle the fact that we have a social problem at the end of the day. It's, it's bad enough that we're losing fish and we're losing biodiversity and we're destroying the marine environment with extremely destructive practices. But what really is bad, and you remember that we have 15,000 scientists that warned humanity just a few weeks ago or a month ago, telling us that we are on a, on a steep decline you know, and co sort of co collision route. We're going to collide with nature. So we have no option. We have to do better. Fish are quite nice. They can reproduce extremely generously. They can fuel large scale you know, our, and, and broad economic activities around the world. But we need to get to the fact that when there is overcapacity, the first uh, victims are small scale sectors. And so 90% of, um, when we have 90% of uh, subsidies going to the large scale sector, that means that we agree that we are all and we're all culprits, we are all agreeing to the destruction of viable social small-scale sectors. And they should be an absolute priority because it just makes sense. Not that they're nicer, maybe they are, that's not the point. 
Small is not always beautiful. If you have too many fishing boats, even if they're a small scale, they will do a lot of damage. The, the, but the, the reality is, and it's been shown scientifically, that small scale boats are the best hope for sustainability because they provide the best job ratio to fish, uh, to, the, to the amount of fish caught, and they use the minimum amount of fuel, and, and they, don't, they don't consume that many subsidies. So they don't, they're usually not even, you know, represented politically in a, in a very efficient way so that they can grab, you know, financial incentives. So we do need to make sure that we have viable social uh, sectors which are kept um, afloat. So that's the, one of the reasons why we think it's, um, of course, oops, uh, very important. Um, another reason um, is that, and I find it extremely important to bear in mind for delegates, um, even those that may show some bad will at some point probably in your negotiation, is that um, a WTO set of dis disciplines, very strong disciplines on fisheries subsidies, are going to help everyone, right? So it's a win-win scenario, no question. But also, there are some countries which are under extreme pressure from their fishing lobbies, and we know, right? We all know. So the, the, the idea of having an agreement, an international and legally binding agreement, is a very good excuse for these countries who exactly know that they have to reform their policies. They know they have to do it. But they cannot because they have so much political pressure. So when you talk to fisheries managers individually, they all know they have the science, they have the data. It's just such straightforward data. They know they have to do the job. They know that their industry is actually shooting a bullet in its own feet and that at the end of the day, everyone loses. But they are in their politicians. They are in short-term management of their own political mandate. And so they have to... Uh, respond to the pressure exerted by the fishing lobbies. So our, let's say, message to those countries which are under um, pressure from the fishing lobbies is that please go and adopt the, the most ambitious language you can uh, on this international um, s sequence uh, with the WTO disciplines because then you will have a very good reason to go through reforms that at the end of the day, whether it takes 10 years for your industry to realize and to say thank you, they'll turn around and they'll say thank you for having done it because we're on this steep road to you know, decline and worse. So that would be my um, message to um, WTO delegates and especially countries which we know have an economic model of having extremely subsidized fishing capacity, which is exported elsewhere, and so they rely on subsidies. Um, we tell them just go ahead and have strong international commitments so that you can turn around and really try to do a good job with your own industry. Thank you very much, uh, Claire, for this uh, plea. Uh, you made a, a very important point about the difference uh, or the impact of subsidies on uh, large-scale uh, fleets versus small-scale. You can see a poster here that uh, your organization, Bloom, has uh, had put out for the uh, Ocean Conference in New York, uh, where uh, this was a, a major issue also. We did not mention it, but there was also a call for action in New York in June uh, under the leadership of uh, Ambassador Thompson, actually, uh, asking the WTO to accelerate work to complete negotiations at, uh, at the WTO on this issue. So uh, that I think, you know, there is an expression, an image uh, is worth more than a, a thousand words. Uh, Maybe some of you have seen this image on Twitter or on the Bloom website. Uh, this is open, uh, op I understand it's open uh, software as we say, like you can, uh, you can use it, reproduce it and circulate it. I think it, it's, it's very good. Uh, in a way, and I'm going to direct um, a, a question to Alice Tipping uh, uh, from ICTSD who has been uh, spending, uh, I don't know how many years, uh, uh, working on this issue out of Geneva, first uh, uh, with the uh, New Zealand uh, uh, mission in, in Geneva and now with uh, 
ICTSD. So we have two Kiwis. That's very good. Uh, the, my question to, to, to Alice is uh, this situation of, uh, of um, large scale versus uh, uh, small scale, can it be said that in effect, uh, if the status quo the, it was maintained and uh, uh, fisheries uh, subsidies were not reformed in the way that we uh, all hope, uh, could, could it be said that in fact it's the large f fleet fleets and, the, and the, 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 the few countries who uh, are um, uh, developing them that would benefit of, uh, in order to use the jargon of the WTO, who would uh, in fact benefit of special and differential treatment. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, sh should, uh, we know that there are uh, developing countries and least developed countries who very legitimately say that we have to take into account of their own uh, special and differential uh, uh, treatment necessary for necessity for it but in fact shouldn't we uh, say that if we maintain the status quo those who are uh, <coughs> having a special treatment are are the big guys and uh, we need to resolve this question uh, quickly is this a, a fair uh, description of the situation uh, alice Thank you very much, um, Remy, and thank you to, to both of you for putting this session together. Um, and you're exactly right. ICTSD has been working on the issue of fishery subsidies for a very long time, um, and I've been working on them, on fishery subsidies for even longer than that. And I think there's this is the closest that we've come to some kind of an outcome uh, on fishery subsidies. So it's fantastic that members are moving towards at least at, le at the very minimum a political commitment. Um, to answer your question first, and then I wondered if I, while I have the floor, I could ask Ambassador Walker a question. Um, but to answer your question, I think that's a good argument. I mean, and Claire was talking about the data that we have, which indicates that the vast majority of fisheries subsidies are provided, particularly because they're provided in the form of fuel subsidies, and it's the larger, more industrialized vessels that use the most fuel and therefore benefit the most from the subsidies that are provided. I think there's, men, there's merit in the argument that you're making, that in the fact the lack of discipline on that kind of subsidy ends up benefiting the larger fishes more than the smaller fishes. And to the extent that the larger and smaller fishing industries compete with each other, in some places they do, in some places they don't, but to the extent that they do, you're in fact undermining the smaller scale fisher's ability to access the resource itself. So there's sort of two distortions. There's an advantage to the larger players and the ability for the smaller players to make a living is also being undermined to the extent that there's competition and to the extent that the resource is actually depleted. Um, but I wondered while I have the floor, if I could ask Ambassador Walker, you were involved in, in fact, I think you led New Zealand's negotiations with China on the FTA. You led for New Zealand on the negotiation of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. You're, I think, quite used to these last stages of a negotiation where it's as much a political argument as it is a technical one. And I wondered, in the context of a Chatham House rules discussion, if you could give us a sense of the politics that, that, that's going on in the negotiations at the moment. I mean, you alluded a little bit to the fact that some members wanted to link or had talked about linking fisheries subsidies to other parts of the Doha development agenda uh, or other parts of the issues that were on the table at least. You've alluded to that a little bit, but could you tell us a little bit about sort of how the political dynamics are, are currently sort of swaying back and forth, uh, specifically around the fishery subsidies outcome across the road? Yeah, sure. Uh, I wouldn't say that anybody's looking to draw an overt uh, link from fisheries negotiation to another part of a negotiation, um, because there is, there is this recognition, I think, um, by all governments, however practically inconvenient they might find it at the moment, that there is this commitment out there, SDG, and there was the Oceans Conference that, that reinforced it. Um, um, way up. Uh, more of the politics around it, I think, are really anchored in what I was talking about earlier. Um, how, do I, how do I implement this? Um, there is also this 
uh, the issue of um, development, special and differential treatment. And it's, you know, these days, with a changed structure in the world economy, um, it's a bit different from how it used to be. And even in the fish sector, it's quite different because something like, um, and data is always good to have, something like, what, 35% of the subsidies are coming from developing uh, countries. And actually some of the largest subsidizers are developing countries. And other developing countries are, um, you know, they're looking at that picture over there and they're thinking, you know, hey, um, why can't I have some of those uh, big ships? You know, all these people from other countries have been out doing these bad things for years. Um, I want a bit of the action as well. Uh, so I don't want to be constrained from developing my own um, big ships that can go out and, and do things. So there's, there's quite uh, complicated dynamic uh, in here. The WTO is only looking at one part of this, right? Um, which is the subsidies part. There are all the other parts um, that uh, countries cooperate in, in forming up um, management arrangements uh, between each other in particular areas. And I think we saw another one of those just announced a, a week or so ago up in, um, up in northern sea parts. So all of that has to go on um, alongside uh, this particular uh, effort here, um, which is about um, just governments giving subsidies. Uh, and uh, at the heart of it is you shouldn't be giving those sorts of subsidies anymore. Um, so again, I go back to the fact that nobody can go straight to delivering the whole thing here but everybody recognises that the, the whole of that does need to be um, delivered. So what is not delivered here, absolutely, that's why the declaration starts up front by saying, you know, we, we recognise this and we're determined to continue to work to deliver the whole thing. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ambassador. Um, now that we're in the interactive mode, as you've noticed, uh, we have slides with uh, the whole uh, uh, draft uh, decision, including the addendum from uh, Canada, New Zealand, uh, Norway, and there is another one, uh, anyway, the EU, the EU, of EU, course. Yeah. Uh, if during the discussion you wish to like to speak about uh, paragraph uh, three alt five, can you pull it up? Uh, you know, I'm here for. That's why we've done that, and it might be helpful if, if we happen to get into the nitty-gritty during this uh, discussion, so just say it. Uh, amongst uh, all the friends in, in this room, uh, uh, there are some uh, that I know best uh, than others, but I, I see an, an important player also. It's uh, the representative of the FAO in, uh, based in Geneva, uh, William uh, Emerson. I'm wondering if you, uh, it's Chatham House rule, uh, if you uh, wish to, 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 to make any, uh, any uh, provide any input from your perspective. The FAO, of course, as we all know, is, is the uh, international body uh, uh, regulating uh, uh, fisheries uh, through its uh, of a committee on fisheries and, and other works, and, and you've been uh, uh, very much also uh, uh, playing an important role advising, uh, I think we can say that, advising the, 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 the negotiating group on, on rules with your, from a technical perspective, which maybe would be, I'm sure it would be uh, helpful if you think you can. Historically, work on fisheries subsidies but um, not uh, more recently, and I think that's partially because there was a concern uh, the activity of the negotiations and the fact that um, studies done by the FAO may or may not influence the uh, negotiations one way or another. But that being said, um, we are very aware of the current situation um, of 30% of the, um, the fish stocks being at 
being uh, exploited at unsustainable levels uh, and therefore being overfished and that um, overcapacity contributes to the overfishing situation but uh, as well uh, does illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing. So from our perspective, um, an outcome that will discipline the use of those subsidies, either through outright prohibitions or um, any other mechanism, would be, would be a, a helpful one um, and a very desirable one. The, the question of special differential treatment will always be a, a slightly problematic one. I think um, we all recognize that countries have development aspirations and those need to be respected. But we also know that some countries already have fully developed fisheries and may be trying to, um, to uh, benefit from a subsidies regime which would allow them to further develop their fisheries. And I think we really need to, in that process, um, keep in mind the sustainability imperative. I mean, for us, that is uh, part of our mandate and, uh, and something that we would really like to see come out of um, MC11, uh, that would be ideal. Um, but uh, if not, uh, a little later. And just picking up on uh, Ambassador Walker's reference to SDG 14.6, we, we do have a 2020 commitment. The um, risk we face uh, in the absence of an outcome at the WTO is that countries will, at the national level, need to find a way to um, live up to that commitment. And that will be a lot more difficult to do on a national basis than it is through a multilateral agreement where everybody is facing the same rules and the same disciplines rather than leaving it to countries to decide how to implement those the requirements that have agreed to in SDG 14.6. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. As always, uh, I see you. Uh, as always, uh, the FAO is extremely careful, uh, behaving like walking on eggs, but I hope that uh, after this uh, ministerial conference, with the good decisions, you will be at least w walking on hard-boiled eggs, and, and you will be m able to, to make more head waves. Uh, and it's great to have your, uh, your input in, in, into this discussion. Thank you very much, uh, William. Madam, please uh, introduce yourselves when uh, I'm unable to, to, to introduce you myself. Uh, so that everybody knows uh, who you are. Thank you. I am Eliana Di Giovanni from Argentina. I wanted to congratulate Ambassador Walker and your country for uh, putting this issue, this initiative on the floor. And I want to congratulate you, President Nuviam, for encouraging the delegates to get a legally binding agreement as soon as possible. I think that this could be the a central outcome of Buenos Aires conference. It's, it's a pity that, as Ambassador Walker said, perhaps not yet we can reach this outcome. But in any case, thank you for all your efforts. And just, just a question. ¿Hay algún representante del Ministerio de Producción o del Ministerio de Agroindustria aquí, de Argentina? Well, they are very busy. <laughs> thank you, thank you again. Sí, uh, muchas gracias, uh, uh, señora. Yo quiero, I, I'll switch to, to English if you allow me. Um, Argentina uh, is actually uh, playing, uh, I think, its fair share, uh, of course, uh, also as chair, chair, chairs of this this uh, conference, they, they're also working on he on eggs, I would say. But you may have seen in Clarín a couple of two or three days ago, there was a long interview uh, of Susana Malcora, who was uh, emphasizing uh, very much the, imp the, the 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 importance of of this fisheries uh, negotiation. We sh also saw her a couple of weeks ago in a video put out by the WTO, where she was saying, as as we say, that this is the low hanging fish for uh, the. She was not using the expression, but you know, I'm summarizing what she was saying. There is a real chance. And uh, also in New York, uh, during the preparations for the uh, Ocean Conference, there was a bit of you know, 
discussion during the preparatory meetings about whether this issue should be uh, raised in the call for action and how. And uh, I remember that Argentina uh, made a, a, you know, a, a very, very uh, powerful plea uh, which helped very much getting that language in the, in the call for action. Sir. Yes. And same thing, please introduce yourself. Yes, okay. My name is Leopoldo Estol. I am veterinarian. I am the vice president of the international network of veterinary specialists in animal welfare. I am from Argentina. The problem that we have with this issue is not an economical issue. It's an educational topic. If we talk about the trade of animal by hand problems, we must think that the veterinary profession must give some tool to deal with that. It's easy to see that the veterinary profession, the OIE, has a lot of rules. We have a lot of uh, international rules about the treatment or bad treatment of animals used for production. But about fish, no problem. Nobody take care about that. Only in Nordic countries, like uh, Norway, you may see veterinarians in the whale ships uh, take care about the whale of the way you are killing the whales. You have a veterinarian to see that you don't harm the whales. But nobody take care about the way we capture and let die animals when fishing industry. In Argentina, in any way, you have any issue of control about this. I guess uh, a lot of time I read the book, uh, I miss the book, about the silent cry. Uh, the, you never he hear, hear a fish crying of pain. Uh, and it's usual, they are drowning in air, not when you take away from the water. The veterinary profession has no idea about this topic in Latin America. Any country in Latin America deal about the suffering of fish in a way you are catching. Think about that. It's, a, it's an important point that you're making that uh, trade is fine, but it's not trade at all costs. And maybe uh, Claire, uh, that, that comment from... Uh, uh, I don't want to, of course, side, you know, sidetrack the conversation on this at all, but because we're in Argentina, I think we definitely, the more countries in Latin America that take a very strong, clear you know, elements of legislation to prohibit electric fishing, at least we don't have this temptation. You, do you know Callum Roberts? If you, want, if you have to read one book, you have to read one book about the ocean, it's Callum Roberts. It's called The Unnatural History of the Sea, The Unnatural History of the Sea. And he talks about the troll revolutions through ages. And he shows that the trolling, the, fa the, the trolling um, uh, you know, method has really changed everything when it came to fisheries. And it became so uh, efficient at catching fish that that's what put our large-scale fleets in the dire situations of being so subsidy dependent that they're in. And the last development, once you've caught almost all the fish, what you need to do is a technological race to making sure that you catch the last ones without spending that much fuel anymore because you're spending so much money to go get some fish, but there are not enough fish left that it makes economic sense. Okay, we so you're more dependent on subsidies. It's totally subsidy yeah. dependent. So we're more dependent on subsidies. The less fish there are, the more the industries, and especially the large-scale industry, becomes dependent on subsidies and develops technological capacity to catch the last fish. That's why we know that the bell tolls, you know, for the fishing industry if we don't act strongly on, uh, okay. on, the, on uh, subsidies disciplines. Uh, thank you very much. It was a risk. I took a risk because I know when she starts on electric fishing, no, can't stop. Needed. Stop no, her, it's, but it's totally subsidies yes. related. And also, it's a fact that it is not. A, it's a method that is not selective, so it affects the marine ecosystem. So, 
it's important, I agree. I see four people, at least four people asking for the floor, and we have uh, not so much time, so I, uh, you have, we see... Uh, Yes, exactly, five minutes. So, sir, you, so one, two, the lady at the back, three, the gentleman with a Pacific uh, shirt, uh, obviously, and uh, Andrew Friedman, uh, if you don't mind being last. And we, depending on the questions, we'll decide whether we take all of them rather than one by one, because as, as Alice has pointed out, we have little time. Hi, thank you. Uh, Jack Caperell with Inside US Trade. A question for the ambassador. Uh, if you can assess the probability that members agree on interim disciplines on IUU in addition to a commitment to continue negotiating and uh, transparency requirements as well, it appears as though you've left ministers with five options and a lot of brackets for IUU disciplines. Um, do you think you've left ministers with too many options to work through in the couple of days that they have here? Um, and, you know, which one of those options or combinations of those options do you think is most likely to be uh, arrived upon, if any? So that's a very important question on prognosis. Uh, Alice, I, I just want a, a clarification. You said five minutes, but the program says 12.15. Eh? So I think we have more. We have 20. We have 20 minutes, so uh, do you want to take that, uh, that question uh, individually? Because it's an important one, I think it's very sure. valid. And since we've corrected, <laughs> we have more, uh, what time frame, I think you, you can go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for an excellent question. Well, inside US trade gets to all the best places. Uh, I, I'm not gonna try and put a prognosis on that. I mean, the, the, the five options that you see uh, come out of the fact, as I was saying earlier, that um, people were coming straight out of that uh, negotiation on a legal text and therefore they kind of transmitted their mindset across to, if we're going to make this commitment now, um, how do we ensure that all our legal concerns are potentially covered in it? So, it looks quite complicated, but there are there are only you know a few main issues in there which are expressed differently through the options. So I expect the the conversation around that will kind of triage through the key questions that are sitting there in those different options and see if they can tease out a um, a direction of a landing zone which will be tolerable to the the entire membership. That's the way these things generally work. Um, there's, there's quite a, uh, a high degree of consensus around the idea that we should have something on IUU coming out of uh, this meeting. There's much less around overfished, which is why you see that the overfished language is coming over from a handful of us. We think are quite an important handful, but it's less than the entirety uh, of the group. Um, but certainly I think the effort is to get something in addition to just the ongoing work program. Thank you very much. Uh, Hi. Please go. Um, Leah Worrell from the Overseas Development Institute. Um, so before coming to the conference, we conducted an impact analysis of fishery subsidy removals globally. And we find that actually removing them mean, just means that efficient firms actually have a strong role in... Um, for highly subsidy dependent firms, when you remove the fisheries, efficient firms that are less reliant on subsidies may well come in and fill the space. But the two things that we found is there are two areas specifically where um, strong action could be helpful, which was IUU fishing, but particularly on the enforcement mechanisms um, for that, as well as fuel subsidies. So looking at the role of fuel subsidies in distant water fishing. So I suppose, um, there are some political stick, sticking points there, and I, I think I'll focus my question on the second one, which is, what is your perspective on the ability to reach a negotiation that includes fuel subsidies? That's... Who wants to take that one? Uh, uh, I think... Well, just, just maybe through, David yeah. starts, and maybe you want to add something. 
just very quickly to say that I think you know a lot of us recognise the significance of fuel subsidies in in the whole architecture of subsidies environment. So it's definitely got to be part of the uh, the discussion in terms of how the disciplines are framed up on the overfishing overcapacity um, for a legal agreement. How it's going to land, I don't know yet. You want to? I know I mean, it's one of your favorite subjects. So. Well, the thing is, that the same thing. The science has been there, has been so probably. I'm going to look at your, at your analysis, but it just it just reconfirms all the time that most subsidies do lead to overcapacity at the end of the day, and especially those that contribute to large scale fishing operations which at the end of the day are so unsustainable and so unviable economically without subsidies that they do need to increase their uh, capacity to fish more quickly and more, and so they need more subsidies. So this whole thing is really just a typical vicious circle. Um, I wish you good luck because there are very important subsidies to tackle. And let me say, if I may, that one of the values of, uh, of such a gathering is that it provides opportunities for uh, creating, uh, for networking and creating bonds and, and, and uh, uh, conversions. And uh, I can see, for example, that Bloom and your organization should, should uh, speak um, more together. And uh, there is a lunch break after this session, and maybe you, you, you can. Uh, you can at least, at minimum, exchange uh, business cards. By the way, I've been told that, in fact, because there is a lunch break after this session, we're allowed to eat uh, a bit more uh, time uh, if we want, and if, we, if, if we're not in such I, a rush to I eat uh, food. But I know you have yeah. to go, of course, uh, because you have, to go, you have serious serious negotiations to, to carry out. So, uh, uh, sir, uh, was I right to say that you have a South Pacific shirt? Uh, yes, that's from correct. which island? Uh, this is a uh, Bula shirt so to, from Fiji. Okay. So my, my name's Adam Wolfenden. I work for the Pacific Network on Globalization. Um, we've been following these talks for a while and sort of listening to, I think, what people have talked about today, what like, you know, I think we can all agree like, that you know, a lot of these subsidies, there's a huge crisis in the sustainability of stocks. What concerns me is the, the framing and the way that we're talking about um, um, special and differential treatment. Uh, it, you know, it's enshrined in SDG 14.6, but hearing the way it's discussed, it's, it's, it's saying, everyone's saying it's kind of problematic, that there's some developing countries, which I think you know, we're all kind of assuming everyone's saying China, um, you know, are developing their fleets and SDT is really problematic, but it's actually not problematic. It's, it's how these countries retain their right to actually say, well, you know, if Fiji wants to develop its own fishing industry and support them and use the subsidies that New Zealand, that the European Union have used for so long to develop their industries. And what we're seeing from the proposals is, is an actual... It's a quite a very ambitious grab to take that right away from them. And I think for, for Pang and a lot of Pacific Island countries, a lot of these, these texts and these proposals from New Zealand, the EU, Iceland, are quite outrageous. And, and it, the way we view them is it's, it's about market domination. It's not about sustainability. And I guess I'd like to hear what you think about that position because that's what we're hearing from delegates, that's what we're hearing from a lot of developing countries. And it seems very ironic that those, those countries who have built their industries are now the ones saying, under the, issue, under the name of sustainability, you can't do that. And I think that's, you know, we would also re reassert the right of those nations to manage their resources under their EEZs. And I think that's, you know, we're seeing that, that component still in square brackets in a lot of these texts. So, yeah, I'll, I'll be curious to hear what you guys think about that. So, uh, conditionalities, you, you start? Uh, sure. Um, no, it, it's clear that uh, special and differential treatment in, in some way uh, is a core part of the negotiation that, that is going on and will take place and indeed is a, is a core part there of the, um, of the SDG target itself. Um, but the question is how, how can that be done um, in a way that 
delivers to yeah. the sustainability objective of everyone, including um, uh, the, the countries concerned. And um, I mean, as you know, um, from our perspective, uh, we do a lot of work with um, uh, generally small island developing states uh, through the UN system, but particularly in the, in the Pacific to try and encourage um, sustainable development of resources and try and guard against uh, others who might um, look to exploit those resources and take them away from the, the Pacific Islands. So it's not about taking away anybody's right to develop, it's about how trying to put that supportive environment around internationally how that's done. And as I was saying, the subsidies bit is very much only um, a part of it. So, you know, domestic uh, fisheries management, you're right. Um, uh, you clock back um, a whole number of years and we didn't have the, the greatest regime uh, in our own EZ, but we put a, a regime in place which was quite um, controversial at the time that was introduced with the, the fishing industry but they've seen the, the real benefits of, of that uh, over time because it's led to a much more um, sustainably uh, valuable resource for that industry. So the other side of this is um, uh, providing some assistance to developing countries to sort of move in this direction. Um, technical assistance, capacity building, uh, aid programs, they all have to come into it in some sort of holistic um, solution at the end of the day. I have identified a, a lady who wants to speak on that subject and, and sir there. I'm wondering if uh, Andrew Friedman would not mind being, uh, because I, it's an important discussion. And while we're having it, let's not forget the poster, because, you know, when we talk of... Yes, so you said Yeah, one I just word. want to compliment this. I mean, I can, I understand your point and I agree with this answer that it is a complex discussion that's occurring anyway. But um, in our views, we just have to bear in mind that the, the fishing capacity is more than double worldwide what it should be. So at the end of the day, um, thinking, I mean, these SDT conversations are crucial and they're occurring anyway. Uh, but we do have to bear in mind that those are going to make the biggest sacrifices, of course, are the biggest industrialized fishing nations at this stage. And so I agree with the, Remy's question earlier to Alice, you know, is it, is it, an, you know, is it, is it not uh, the special and differential treatment? Is it not actually to the advantage of, of large-scale players? Today it is. The regime is such that if we keep on doing what we're doing, they're never going to put their uh, fishing capacity in equation with the biological resources. So we do need to grab this. Do we need to reduce the overcapacity worldwide? And then it's a domestic question, how you want to be fishing. And we, as civil society, we encourage the, the biggest employment ratio with the least impact on the environment, i.e. small-scale fishing and low-impact fisheries, if possible. Right, but that's then an internal decision how you want to go about the fish, the management of your fish resources. But really, bear in mind that you know, for as long as we're parking this conversation because of SDG issues, we're actually benefiting large-scale players. You're all wonderful because we're having a real interactive dialogue, and that's really what we wanted. So, uh, Mademoiselle, hello, uh, Mandy from Hong Kong. So my question relates to the current reality under the WTO negotiation framework because it's extremely difficult to get the consensus from all the membership and on certain topics and especially like such controversial fisheries subsidies. So I wonder uh, if it's preferable to start with a limited membership like um, it's the same in the, similar in the climate change framework. There is a concept of climate collapse. So is it preferable to start from plurilateral basis to get those countries that are most interested and most willing to participate to get them start and then expand the membership in future? Thanks. I think it's a question for for, uh, <laughs> for uh, David again. Well, I wouldn't wouldn't say it's. Uh, and thank you very much. By the way, we really appreciate your input. Uh, fundamental coming from. 
Hong Kong and from your region? So I, I wouldn't say it's preferable in, in any way. Uh, the, the best way to do this, um, going back to what I was sort of clumsily saying at the beginning and, and Remy put, put much better and Claire's put much better, uh, the, putting the supportive environment around and, and also made by the FAO, putting the supportive environment around what everybody ultimately needs to do individually. So, yes, it's difficult to put the consensus together, um, but often you don't see a consensus until very late in the piece in, in these processes because people are reflecting back at home, um, what am I going to do? And they're holding positions in the negotiation until they see where, where the centre of gravity is emerging and then how they can fit into that. So we strongly think that the multilateral effort is the way that it should go. Um, we have ourselves um, participated in an attempt to make a start uh, in a regional context, and that was in the, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations. That was the first uh, agreement, FTA agreement, that had provisions on fish subsidies in it. Um, we did that because we thought it might help a little bit amongst the countries involved in that, but also because we wanted to send a clear signal that this is something that we should try and build out um, amongst our partners in the region. But there's no substitute, uh, ultimately, when you come to subsidies, no matter what it is, to the, the WTO. Thank you. And of course, uh, well, we know what happens. And, but you have an initiative now, the comprehensive... Uh... Uh, yeah. The, the comprehensive partnership for, or comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. But Which it's, is um, that's eleven of us trying to pick up. I, I don't want to get into uh, mm. that story, but I will. I will just give a brief advertisement on the issue of um, uh, fuel subsidies. Uh, right next door, while we've been sitting in here, um, we and Finland. Uh, hosted an event which uh, a number of other WTO members have signed on to a little statement saying uh, fossil fuel subsidy reform is really, really important. You know, it's been worked on in APEC for a while, G20. Uh, so we would like to bring more of that discussion into the WTO and really start what we can see in the future to do about that as well. Actually, a very important uh, argument. Is there... Uh, yeah, I think we can raise this argument. Uh, it's the fact that if we don't resolve a relatively simple issue such as fisheries subsidies, and um, you know we're talking of money, but uh, nothing in comparison to the fossil fuel money. Yeah? Here we're talking harmful fisheries subsidies around 18, uh, 18 uh, billion, right? Uh, uh, but Fish, uh, fossil fuel subsidies, it's what, 5.3 trillion, right? Uh, so if we don't resolve this one, what hope can we have that we ever uh, resolve uh, fossil fuel subsidies? I think as an environmentalist, I think it's a very strong uh, encouragement to really sort out this thing. Be it, you want to speak on that? There is yeah, a... Yes, I thought it was interesting because we have an office in Hong Kong and so uh, I was brought up there, so I know the uh, Hong Kong fisheries pretty well. And uh, it's, inter it's a really good case of when you um, subsidize, especially with fuel subsidies, your troll fleet, like Hong Kong did for so many years, you end up, the average weight of the catch in Hong Kong was about 10 grams. So it's like three times lighter than a sparrow. And so Hong Kong's fisheries went completely down. So surrounding waters of Hong Kong, so we actually in, ended up subsidizing, we, Hong Kong, so I consider myself a bit of a Hong Kong girl, we ended up subsidizing fishers so that they could stay at port and not do anything. At the end of the day, I can't remember which year exactly, Hong Kong banned trawling, and you know that's how you actually kill your fishery. Not just your, your ecological resource and your biodiversity, you kill your sector. It was such a loser. Hong Kong is, should be a very strong advocate against fuel subsidies and you know, capacity building subsidies. So I think that will be an opportunity of exchanging business cards again. Uh, sir, you have raised the floor and then we have...
he's very patient, Thank you. Uh, Andrew uh, Friedman, and then I think we'll just wrap up. Yes, uh, I come from the Philippines, so it's a country of many islands, and fishing is very important to us. <clears throat> but my question was, uh, I'm, I'm new to this topic, so forgive me if I ask a silly question, but to what extent do you think uh, the removal of the subsidies will curtail uh, illegal or you know the, the bad type of fishing? Because in my country, we have a lot of fishing vessels, uh, relatively large. They are not subsidized, but they do a lot of these illegal things. And if you cut these uh, subsidies to these big ships, uh, my question is, to what extent will they stop overfishing or do bad fishing? Or they, will they find another way to do that? But I'm not saying that removing subsidies shouldn't be pursued. I think it's a very good first step but maybe it will not be enough. And what would be the next steps that would be important? And just a briefly, understanding the WTO, there have been disputes already filed against fish products that are sold using, let's say, illegal means. Uh, I, I remember the Vietnamese strips, I think. So is that also one course of action that we could look at later, uh, using standards as a means for um, challenging certain trade trade uh, of fishery products. I don't well, know if that's a viable option. Okay. We're delighted to see so much input coming from Asia, by the way. Uh, okay, I, I mean, you can complete well, some of the answer. I would, I would tend to have a very short answer to that, which is um, having strong WTO disciplines is an indispensable um, action so that we can sort a financial equation which is doomed. Which, but this does not replace having very strong fisheries management programs in each nation. Um, so you can sort one unviable equation on one hand, but if you decide on, you know, on, it's got 8,000 islands in the Philippines or something. So, I mean, so it's such, you, you, your you know, livelihoods directly depend on fishing. And so you do need to think very, re, you know, ambitious uh, marine programs to make sure that you choose the best possible options for your fishers to create employment and to create food security. So that's going to be your, you know, your own target, I think. But if you want to complement this. No, that's so Andrew Friedman, extremely patient. <laughs> Thanks, Remy. Uh, Andrew Friedman from the Pew Charitable Trust. Happy to wait while an excellent discussion unfolds. Um, my thanks to the panelists uh, for, for making it possible. Um, I was hoping before we conclude we, we could return uh, at least briefly to the topic of the ministerial declaration, uh, which will be up for negotiation this afternoon. Um, I think the question from inside U.S. trade usefully highlighted the, the two core components of the declaration. It's got both uh, substantive commitments, which Ambassador Walker, I think you've, you've outlined quite well, and then a process commitment as well. Uh, reflected in paragraph one, um, which seems, at least for the moment, uh, relatively stable and unbracketed. Um, I was hoping the panelists might be able to comment uh, on the importance um, of this process commitment uh, in the negotiations, the role it will play going forward, um, the importance of the way uh, that that commitment uh, to continue to negotiate is framed, um, and then how you expect the, the substantive commitments also reflected in the declaration to influence that future discussion, uh, whether it's a high ambition or a, a not so high ambition uh, coming out of this ministerial conference. Ambas Thank you. Ambassador Walker. Uh, paragraph one is, is essentially where I started. Uh, paragraph one is very, very important. Um, it's the, we're gonna finish the job paragraph. Um, so that, that is a, a key commitment from here, and I, th I think that we need to even lift it. Um, because as I was saying, it's too late to conclude a negotiation in 2019, um, because then you've already missed the 2020 target. So we need to finish the, finish the thing off next year in order that we can hit that, um, hit that conclusion. Uh, there have been concerns that um, uh, if there's language on the prohibitions uh, agreed here in the declaration which doesn't look right, you know, it's not as clean as people would like, that, that it's going to then undermine the substantive negotiation. Um, we don't see that 
um, because we think that the, the terms of the substantive negotiation are still set by um, uh, SDG 14.6 uh, and the, the substantive, anything substantive coming out of here um, is expressed as in the interim and uh, people have, have said that it's without prejudice to um, the positions they would look to take in those substantive negotiations. So we would like to see uh, substantive provisions here, um, but recognising that um, they're not, uh, you know, determinative of what the final outcome of the negotiation is. So we agree that paragraph one is important. I think we all agree it's, it's key, uh, but it's not enough. And uh, uh, I come back to uh, no political tango, and when the... Uh, the discussion will uh, uh, begin at four o'clock. Uh, will be uh, in the in, in the vicinity of uh, room uh, Pacifico B in the Hilton with a uh, no political tango badges. Uh, and uh, if those of you who have access to to the Hilton, you're welcome to to join us, and you will have a badge if you wish to wear a badge, no political tango, we have to be on a straight uh, tra trajectory in order to, to ban on time uh, the uh, harmful fishery subsidies in, in, in line with the uh, SDG 14.6. Do you want to say just what you take home from this uh, this uh, conversation before we just, uh, you know, depart. The two of you, very quickly, and, you know, what's your, what you take home? Well, I, I just take home that there's uh, a real uh, interest in what's going on down in that other building down there. Um, and I just want to uh, assure you again that um, it is a topic that's being addressed very seriously. Um, people might differ in the way they they come to the table, but I think people are uh, serious in the effort that we need to find a solution to this. And I would say that the the supportive environment that comes from civil society to lend uh, commitment and support to that effort is is really important to um, to bolster the politics around the edges of it. Claire, what do you take home? Well, I'm not sure. I, um, I would say, I would rather say what we hope <laughs> at this stage. And you said Rome was not built in a day, but fisheries were pretty much uh, devastated in just a few decades. Um, so our hopes are very high that you do come to terms with a very ambitious deal because, um, um, because it's needed and because otherwise... How is uh, the 2030 agenda looking? How serious are we to actually start implementing all the other sustainable development goals? So we have, this is the first one. It's a high task on your list. And it's a high responsibility to take at international level to show the world that these SDGs are not just nice language yet again. They actually can have teeth and this should have teeth. So that would be my, um, my, um, take away, let's say, message to the others. Um, and I will also um, ask, let's say, remind that these international commitments are a great excuse to, to actually carry out domestic reforms which seek social and ecological responsibility and sustainability. And um, the last thing is I would really insist that you keep the momentum going because if you don't come to terms and come to grips with the, the agreement on this occasion, let's not deflate the momentum yet again, like we've known in the WTO through years before it was reignited by the SDGs um, and SDG 14. So please keep the momentum going and wrap a deal at least by the end of 2018, not 2019. Thank you very much. As you can see, uh, and many of you already know, uh, some of us are very active on Twitter, so let's continue the dialogue and, and, and monitor uh, the progress made at the WTO through Twitter. Uh, and, and that includes uh, Evangelis uh, from your delegation. He's extremely active on Twitter and, and makes some uh, very valuable contributions through that means. So I've taken the liberty to to also mention him. Money will not bring the fish back. 
Thank you very much. Thank you.